What's up, everyone? Welcome to the uh, 15th and final class of entry point. Sorry, uh, just a little bit of technical difficulties there. Uh, I'm trying something a little bit new today. Uh, I'm going to be having a couple friends join at the end for the Q&A, uh, which I'm super excited about. Um, but anyway, uh, 15th and final class. Uh, I'm, I can't believe that we're actually here. I'm super excited about it. Um, many of you have now finished the first drafts of your scripts. Uh, some of you have already completed a rewrite. Others are right around the corner from finishing that first draft. Uh, but regardless of where you are, you have done a lot of work. Uh, in just over three months, in addition to spending like 15 hours watching all of these videos, if you've done all the assignments, that means that you've read at least 12 scripts. It means uh, that you've reread at least one of those with new insights in mind. You've read columns uh, and watched videos from some extremely successful and knowledgeable screenwriters. You've traded outlines with someone in this class and given feedback on theirs. You've reached out to professional screenwriters to try and set up a coffee or Zoom meeting. Um, many of you were successful in that. And you've generated a bunch of ideas for a movie. And you did the work of researching and creating a one pager and writing an outline and revising the outline for one of those before you even set out to write it. That is a lot to do in three months on top of actually writing a first draft of a script. And if you have done all of those things, or even if you come anywhere close, uh, it means that you've got a really strong foundation uh, of knowledge to carry you forward. And now my hope is that you're just gonna like rest for a little bit, maybe the rest of 2023, and then you're gonna dive in and tackle some rewrites to get to your uh, script into the best shape possible. But after you've done that, almost certainly you're gonna be wondering, what do you do next? What can you do with it now? Uh, and that's a reasonable thing to wonder since we do write these things for an audience. So let's talk about that. Uh, but first, if you're joining us for the first time today, that is totally fine. That said, if you're new to screenwriting, this is a 15 week course designed to get you to the first draft of a feature screenplay. And there's a very real reason that I saved this class for last. Writers tend to be dreamers. It's super normal for us to dream about all the things that we might do with what we've written. And so it's easy to be attracted to any like tips or information in that space. But all of the information on how to break in or get your script out there in the world is useless if you haven't written something and if you haven't written something that's great. So rather than put the cart before the horse, I just wanted to focus on what's truly important first. My recommendation would be to go through the rest of the course before you spend too much time thinking about the things that we're gonna to cover today. I am gonna be taking these videos down in late February, so if there's not, there's not quite enough time left to complete the course if you do one per week starting today, but there's close, so if you average just over that, you should be all right. And if you wanna download the videos before I take them down so you can go at your own pace, that is fine too. I honestly don't care. Anyway, uh, before we get into today's topic, uh, I wasn't able to be here uh, live with you last week. So, oh, I would love to hear, uh, you know, just about how it's going. Uh, catch me up on your screenplay. Did you finish? If so, how did you celebrate? If not, uh, what's it gonna take to get you there? What questions can I answer to get you across the finish line? I would also love to hear about how it's been going, connecting with other writers, uh, whether it's professionals or other people who are just beginning to work on their craft. I know some of you have formed groups uh, that you plan to keep going after this class, which is honestly super exciting to hear because I just like know how valuable that kind of thing is. Um, but yeah, catch me up, how's it going? Um, who's finished their script? Um, who's uh, celebrating it? Uh, and uh, what questions do you have that I can answer to help you get across the finish line? And there is usually like a 15 second delay here, so it might be awkward for a second. I have a polished first draft, getting notes, giving to others, etc. Perfect. Sounds like you're doing exactly the right thing. That's fantastic. Nice job. How did you celebrate though? That's an that's a key piece. You got it. You got to celebrate these things because it's a big deal. Still on page 50. Life's been busy. Still in track by 1231. I totally believe that. Absolutely. If you're on page 50, you can finish this thing by the end of the year. Um, just do a little bit every day. Rebecca finished today. Nothing like working to the deadline. That's so cool. I uh, didn't celebrate yet, but uh, we'll be going on an adventure with the doggy. That's great. I went on one right before this, actually, and it was super fun. Um, congratulations, Rebecca. That's fantastic. 
finished the script, did a proofreading pass, and I'm getting psyched for starting an outline for second draft. Great. That's cool that you're going to do an outline for the second draft. Um, I do that sometimes. Uh, it depends on how much work I have to do for the next one. Um, and uh, that's really interesting that you just kind of decided like that's what you need to do to get you there. So that's great. Um, I celebrate by taking the day off. <laughs> that's great. Good. Well, you don't need a drink to celebrate. You, there's lots of ways you can celebrate. Go see a movie. I don't know. Um, but that's super cool. Uh, congratulations. Um, you know, it is a really big deal. Um, so I just, I can't stress that enough. There are a lot of people who always say that they're going to write a screenplay. Most people don't do it. You did. Um, it's a big deal. So congratulations once again. Um, and to those of you who are still working at it, you can do this. I promise you it'll be so worth it once you have. So do whatever you need to do to get it finished this year so you can check off that milestone and celebrate it. Um, it doesn't even need to be good. This is a first draft. Uh, no one writes a good first draft. Ernest Hemingway said that the first draft of anything is shit. So get it written, get it done, and then you can go back and make it good after you've celebrated and rested a little bit. Uh, a couple more. Uh, I was trying to figure out the Discord thingy. Uh, fell down a research hole, realized I had nothing for Act 2B. Hopefully I now have the material uh, after finishing the book. I think you can totally get it done, Kyle. I've uh, been busy with work, got called away, goals to write a treatment. I'll celebrate by uh, asking for feedback with this treatment, other script by emailing a friend who's a ghostwriter for Netflix. Cool. Um, great. And glad you're working on a rewrite already, Rachel. It's fantastic. Well, um, let's, let's jump into uh, today's class. So um, I started this course with William Goldman's famous quote, um, and uh, it seems fitting to end it as well. I'll just give you his full picture there for a second. Um, nobody knows anything. It's true when it comes to writing, and frankly, it's true when it comes to the business. It's not to say that there aren't really smart people in the business. There totally are. But when it comes to breaking in, everyone's got a different path. Um, when it comes to getting a movie made, every movie seems to have a different path. Um, when it comes to what audiences want, they constantly surprise us. Things that seem like surefire hits bomb. Others become wild successes out of nowhere and prompt a mad rush to try and capitalize on a new trend. So uh, everything I share with you here, just like take it with a grain of salt. The information I'm giving you, it's based on my experiences and the experiences of people that I know. Um, I know a lot of professional writers, so it's fairly educated, it, um, but also nobody knows anything, including me. So sometimes your gut may tell you to do something that's against the grain, and once in a while, your gut's gonna be right about that. So it's okay to listen to that sometimes. Um, just like everybody has a different path to breaking in, every movie's got a different path to getting made. Uh, some of those stories are absolutely wild, uh, but there are typical things that tend to happen in order. So, uh, you know, I thought it'd be worth giving you a little bit of direction and, oh, and uh, context around that. So for really low budget movies, let's say like roughly below 2 million, uh, they have, uh, there's a key difference and you can spot it just by looking at this slide. If your movie falls into this range, just get prepared to do a lot of things and send a lot of emails and likely meet a lot of people because it's honestly going to be on you to get the ball rolling. Um, there are plenty of people in places uh, making movies in this range, um, starting with like Hallmarks um, to indie producers to rich people who've always dreamed of producing a movie someday. Distribution can be tricky, but even so, there is plenty of opportunity to actually get a thing made in this space. There's probably more opportunity than within the Hollywood system. And so it's not a bad place to operate if your goal is to simply get something produced, which um, we do these things to reach an audience, so that is a goal. Um, that said, managers and agents almost never sign someone off material that's that low budget, nor do they invest time in sending them out. Um, there are very there are a few reasons for this. So, one, there's like very little money in these movies for writers. If you get a really good deal as a new writer on a small budget movie like this, you might get three percent of the budget on a million dollar movie. That's thirty grand. Um, it's real money. But you don't get most of that until the movie gets made. Very few writers get a movie made every year, let alone multiple movies. And so it's tough to make an actual living that way. Also, most deals are worse than that. Either way, if a manager is getting 10%, you know, off that 30 grand, $3,000, there are better ways for them to spend their time. They're going to focus on clients who can sell things for five or 10 times as much as that, or more importantly, clients who can land assignments that truly pay well. And... That's the other piece of this. A lower budget script doesn't serve as a great sample for scripts at higher budgets. Executives and producers who hire writers for assignments need to be convinced that those writers can deliver on concepts in a way that will attract big directors or stars. 
uh, because those are the things that ensure audiences show up and that the movies make money. So for low budget, you're skipping right past representation and you're going directly to the source. You're gonna be trying to get your work read by people who actually make these things, the producers and sometimes the directors. Uh, to do this, you're definitely going to want a subscription to IMDb Pro. That's where you're gonna find the email addresses for these people. Um, and how do you even find out who they are? So if you have a list of movies in that budget range already, it's a great place to start. You can just look those up in IMDb Pro, check out the companies behind them, reach out to the executives and the producers at those companies and start there. If you don't have that list, it's pretty easy to come up with one on the internet. You can do some Google searching and that'll probably get you there over time. But there are like faster ways. You know, there are all sorts of subreddits about movies out there and filmmaking. You could easily post like a question like, what are your favorite movies made for less than $2 million since 2015? You get a whole list of them and then you can just start like looking at IMDb that way. Um, but also now there's stuff like chat, uh, chat GPT and Bard and where those things are useful is coming up with lists like that. So you can like say, hey, give me a list of 50 movies made since XYZ date for let's say more than 500,000, less than 2 million. It should do pretty well at that. And then you just go to IMDb Pro with that and you just keep going. Um, if you have a contact or an in with a director who's made movies at this budget level before or an actor who has starred in them, they can be worth reaching out to as well. I think it's probably a waste of time at this budget level to go through their agents though. Um, those agents are fielding offers like that all the time and they tend to gatekeep them because they're usually focused on higher, higher profile things. Um, but if you can get an actor or director on board who um, is meaningful in terms of getting a movie sold, that's huge and it can help you get a producer executive really easily, at least much more easily than you do it yourself. So if you have an in, it's not a bad way. Um, there were a few things that came up here. So let me just check if there are any questions. Uh, a couple more people updating on scripts, awesome. Uh, how do we figure out how much budget the movie needs? That's a good question. And that's something that I talked about a little bit before. Um, you know, it's it kind of, you, you, you start to pick that up by paying attention to the budget levels of movies that already exist, right? So like you can find that information online a lot and I would recommend that you just start paying attention to that. But you can kind of also, there are certain things that cause a budget, a budget to be more expensive. Essentially, Time is money. So if you have to spend a lot of time shooting something, um, if you have to spend a lot of time in post-production for like video, uh, VFX and CG, that's all expensive. Obviously big production sets and stunts and things like that, expensive. Big casts are really expensive um, because you have to have a lot, you have to pay for a lot of people to be on set all the time. Um, and also it takes more time to shoot things with a big cast. So those tend to inflate budgets. Um, but if you start, if you kind of poke around and just like look at movies and you can start to get a pretty good feel for budget by just checking it out online. And the more that you steep yourself in this, the more you're going to get a feel for it. But your sub $2 million movies are typically, you know, um, there are some very inexpensive like action movies, but typically they're, they're even, um, they're more like your, your horrors, your dramas. Um, and your, um, you know, romantic comedies, things like that at the lower budget end of the spectrum. Uh, let's see, what else do we have for questions here? Uh, hey, Neris, what's up? I haven't seen, you know, Neris, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing your name right. Hopefully I am. I just have always assumed that's what it is. I, I but I see Neris online all the time. Um, so nice to see you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so there, and um, Rebecca had some good thoughts on budget as well. Anyway, let me keep going. Um, so as I said earlier in class, um, you know, referrals trump everything. Uh, they're gold. So meeting people is really important because if you meet somebody who knows a producer who makes movies like your script and that person you know responds to that idea, they may offer to make that introduction and that makes your chances of getting them to read you a billion times higher. Anyway, um, you're gonna email these producers or executives, hopefully a bunch of them, and in a perfect world, you get some of them to read, and one of them loves the material so much that they wanna make it, and fantastic. Um, ideally, everything goes smoothly. They pay, uh, or they, sorry, they attach a director and a star, they pay you for it, they shoot it, and you have a movie within a couple of years. Um, so what should you expect in terms of pay? Again, it's not a lot, um, and most likely, they'll pay you very little or even nothing until uh, you actually begin production, also known as principal photography. 
If they have their own money, they'll probably option your script. If they don't, they'll probably want to do a shopping agreement. So let's talk about those things for a second. Um, but first, you know, once you're at a point where you're talking about signing your name on a piece of paper that's giving someone some sort of rights in relation to your work, you absolutely always, without question, must engage an attorney. And not like your cousin who does divorces. You need an entertainment attorney who is like steeped in the world of making movies. This is another downside of the low budget world, unfortunately. Um, legal fees don't change a whole lot based on the script size, which means that they're eating into a bigger chunk of your income. Expect to pay something like one to $2,000 to handle your deals. If you're really in a tight spot, you can save some money by asking an attorney to like simply look over a document and give you a consultation. It's not really ideal, but it is an option. Um, but a good entertainment attorney will help you negotiate a much better deal than you could get for yourself. So it may pay for itself anyway. This goes way beyond money. Uh, it includes all sorts of provisions that ensure that you get important rights like bonuses or getting to write a sequel or things like that. If it's a bigger script and there's a deal on the table though, you might be able to get an attorney on board uh, by signing with them your, as your actual rep. From here on out, they just take 5% of your earnings as a screenwriter and they handle all your legal work as a blanket deal. This is how I've always operated myself, but again, it's because my scripts play in a space that's a little bit larger than that like super low budget range. Um, or And is you know that means that it's capable of generating a certain amount of income that it makes it worth the attorney's time. So if you've got someone offering a deal with let's say a purchase price of, I don't know, north of $50,000, um, then I'd say it's worth seeing if you can find an attorney like this. It means that you don't pay anything up front uh, and it means that you've got somebody really helpful who's actually on your team and all that is really important. But regardless, please don't skip the attorney step if you actually have uh, an opportunity to sign something. It's tempting when there's not that much money in it anyway, but I have seen way too many writers skip that step and like kind of get screwed as a result. So just don't do that. Um, but let's talk about options. So an option is simply a contract that gives the company the option to buy your script within a set period of time. During this time, you can't sell it to anybody else and they essentially control the rights. For this privilege, you usually get paid something up front. The option agreement also lays out all the terms of the purchase agreement. So in that option agreement, you know how much you'll be paid if they buy the script. Any bonuses for production or getting sole credit on the movie will be included. Uh, any backend will be included. Guaranteed fees for rewrites may be included. Oftentimes, especially in the lower budget world, you get none of these things. But again, a good attorney might be able to help you get at least some of them. In low budget world, that upfront option fee could be like as low as a dollar. More often, it's usually like $100, maybe up to 1000 Options in the two to five million budget range tend to be better, um, you know, and they improve as budgets get higher. As a non-guild writer, the most that I've ever been paid is 7,500 for an option. The most I've seen another non-guild writer get for one is 15,000. Um, but that was a really unique occurrence and I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody else break 10,000 as a non-guild writer. Um, so, you know, it's, it's real money, but it's nothing, it's not gonna change your life and you're not gonna quit your job off of a single option fee. Um, once it becomes a guild agreement though, the option fee actually gets a little bit better um, because it, it's at least 10% of the purchase price, which is pretty cool. So guild agreements also have lots of other things built in that are excellent for writers, which is why most of us want to get into the WGA. Uh, so although you, know, you often won't get it on your first movie, if you can push for that WGA agreement on a movie above the $2 million threshold, do it uh, because you will be really glad that you did. So as far as purchase prices go, there is a big range, but a pretty typical range is like two to 3% of the budget. Newer writers often get less. Um, it's rare for a writer to see more. Sometimes you'll hear people say a script was sold when it's really optioned. Technically that's not true because after the option period lapses, that's usually 12 to 18 months by the way, if they don't renew it, all rights return to the writer. And although it's a little bit of a bummer because it means that they're not making the movie, um, you do get to keep the option money, which is nice. When a script sells, it means that they actually paid the full purchase price for it. It's pretty rare to, to see outright script sales these days. It does happen, but it's not common, so that's why I'm not really talking about it much. Um, but typically, when a script is actually bought, it's because production has now begun. The company's now investing millions of dollars into the movie. They need to ensure that they own the rights for real now. So most contracts say that they must pay the writer the purchase price on the first day of principal photography. 
and I'm going to pause because I think there are a couple questions. Have you heard any success stories that started by getting interest from an actor, thinking uh, B-list actors who maybe are, aren't getting offered roles that um, might be interested? Casting is tough in general right now, but yeah, I mean, I, I've got a good friend who um, he it kind of started with an actor. Um, his manager connected the script with an actor and um, she's got some real star power. And so that helped get a whole bunch of other pieces moving. And I think there's a reasonable shot that movie's going to get made next year. I've got another friend who um, reached out to an actor himself um, because that actor has a production company. And I would say, like, they're a really well-known and respected actor. Um, I don't know if B-list is quite the right word, but they're not the most, you, you know, they're not the most marketable actor now. But they've got their own production company, and they're capable of getting things done at a certain budget. So my friend reached out directly to that production company, and the actor actually called him back about a script and was like, hey, I love this. Let's do something. And so... That hasn't materialized yet, but there's been something in the works there, which is pretty cool. So it can happen. Um, it's not common, but it's not something to rule out either. You mentioned people getting screwed without an attorney. What are some examples of getting screwed? Um, so examples would be like um, you people have been screwed out of credit when they didn't expect it. Um, people have, um, you know, the, there have been um, like clauses in there that cause them to not get paid what they expected to get um, or simply just like benefits that writers should typically get weren't included in the contract, um, which can be any number of things. Um, so it's like, you know, at the end of the day, as screenwriters, we sign our copyright away. Like we don't own the thing anymore. So if we're not going to own it, we should be compensated fairly well in a number of ways. And it's important to make sure that we're getting those things. And that's why we need attorneys. Um, would it be useful to become a member of the WJ? Uh, I mean, beginners and all that, does it make sense? Yeah, I mean, everybody, anybody who's writing screenplays for a living, in my opinion, should want to be part of the WGA. You can only get into the WGA, though, if you sell a script uh, to a WGA signatory or if a WGA signatory company hires you to write a script. Um, and that's the only way in. Um, and it's tricky because a lot of companies have, um, like, two separate companies, one which is signatory and one which isn't. So they'll try and hire you a lot of times under that non-signatory company so that they don't have to pay the extra guild fees um, and things like that. If the option into production, would they pay the remaining 90% to buy it? Uh, yes, the remaining 90%. The option typically goes against the, um, the full purchase price. However, if they renew the option, this is one of the things that an attorney can be helpful for a lot typically, um, like if they pay to renew the option, they pay either the same fee or a fee that's close to that. And that second fee, it does not go against the purchase price. So it's just extra money for you. Um, so pretty cool. Uh, Herb, let's talk about that in the Q&A if we can, just so I can stay on topic here, but we can totally cover that. Um, so shopping agreements. Shopping agreements are more and more common these days, especially in the lower budget ranges, but I've got two of them right now on scripts in like the five to 15 million range. Shopping agreement is basically something a producer uses to give them the exclusive rights to shop the material around to directors, actors, financiers, et cetera. Um, usually the time limit is something like six to 12 months and then it can be renewed if both parties agree. Um, I'm just gonna say it, they're less exciting because you're not getting paid anything up front. Uh, but the upside is that producers have fewer rights. So um, you often get to be involved in the decision making. And although this is kind of a thing that doesn't happen too often because you're both playing for the same team with the same goal, as a, for instance, if like they really want a director for a project and you don't think that they're a good fit, you can say so. Um, with an option, you really can't. They kind of have the rights to do what they want. Also, if you're unhappy with them as producers for any reason, you can just bounce after the shopping agreement expires and not allow them or anyone they're working with to option it at all. Um, again, that's a pretty rare situation, but the point is, you just have a little bit more freedom with a shopping agreement. And uh, they're what more and more producers are using these days. So it's worth recognizing that they're a normal part of the business and uh, they're certainly an okay thing to do if that's the best option you have to get a movie made. Um, with scripts that are a little bit higher budget and above, the basic flow from script to movie is very much the same as low budget scripts. You typically have a producer typically uh, bringing in a director, then a star and a financer or a studio to get into production. Sometimes they'll partner with another production company early on that will have its own connections and capabilities to help those other pieces to fall into place. 
Sometimes that company actually belongs to the director or the star they bring in. And also, although it's typically true for lower budget material as well, it is definitely true that once budgets grow bigger, you should expect to do like a new rewrite every time one of those people comes on board. Uh, everyone has opinions and that's the collaborative nature of the business. Um, so just be prepared for it. Um, but hopefully you don't have to do too many of those rewrites for free. And again, that can be a useful reason to have your reps involved. But all that's a bit cart before the horse because if you don't uh, know these people already and you don't have a referral, to get your foot in the door with these higher level producers and executives, you almost always need a rep to help you do that. And um, this is going to be a manager or an agent and it, much more often for newer writers, it's a manager. So the difference between agents and managers can be a little bit confusing. So I'm gonna talk about that for a minute. Um, so agents are the like powerhouse connectors of the industry. While everyone in the business, business needs to know people, agents need to know basically everybody. Their job is to sell your scripts and to get you paid to write assignments. Uh, those at bigger agencies, which is where the majority of writers who are actually have uh, stable careers are set up, they also have um, an additional super critical resource. The biggest directors and stars at the, are at their agencies too, and this makes it much, much easier to get them to read your script and consider it. But agents don't really uh, do a whole lot of developing material or writers, and they tend to care only about the most high profile projects. And that means that they don't typically sign writers until they're already working and successful. And while most people would consider me to be working and at least a little bit successful, I still don't have an agent. Uh, so that should give you an idea of, you know, when they tend to enter the picture. It very may well happen uh, when my movie comes out, especially if something, you know, if it's well received or if one or, you know, the three or four things that I have set up right now sells or something, you know, just notable happens with them, but I'm just clearly not there yet. And you know, it's just, it's common for things to work that way. Agents and lawyers are the only people who under California law can help you procure work. In reality, uh, managers do a lot of massaging in that area, but they do have to keep some degree of distance. So their job is much more about developing you and developing your material. And that's why a big part, that, or that's a big part of why uh, most writers get managers before agents. So developing you means that they push you to write new and better and probably more marketable things, but it also means introducing you around town to like producers and executives and, and more and getting you meetings with people who might actually be able to pay you for something or at least help you get paid. And that means that just like with agents, to do their jobs well, they need to know a lot of people. So developing your material, uh, and that means that they're pushing you to rewrite and rewrite something until they can feel that you know, you can get it sold. Um, that's a big part of it as well. So agents charge 10% of whatever you make. Managers also charge 10% of whatever you make. Occasionally, some managers will charge 15% if you don't already have an agent. Um, I wouldn't say that's that makes a manager like not legitimate, but it's definitely atypical. It's kind of looked down upon. Typically, it's gonna be 10%. Um, just gonna pause here. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, let's see. Is it worth showing the script to a producer and a director who doesn't normally work in the genre? It can be. Uh, sometimes, you know, people are looking for different things. I would say it's more common with directors than producers. A lot of times producers do have like a, a specific wheelhouse or a couple specific wheelhouses where sometimes directors are looking to like do something creatively different. But you never know. Um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt, but like you're less likely to get a hit with somebody who doesn't typically operate in that space. In your case, how long did it take after sign option shopping agreement with the producer to the date you learned the movie was actually getting made? With Aftermath, it was super fast uh, this time. Um, we signed the option in like August of 21 and it was greenlit in January, uh, which is insane. Um, but like it was option once before and like, it just, it was an 18 month option and it lapsed and it never got made. So, I mean, it can be different every single time. So many writers will tell you that um, a bad rep is worse than no rep. I totally agree with this. If you've got someone who's giving you notes and they aren't actually helping you improve your work, that is bad. If you think somebody is doing the job of getting your work out there, but they're not, that's also bad because now you've taken your foot off the gas in this area and nothing's actually happening for you. So landing that first manager feels like a massive deal. Um, because like after years of hard work, 
you finally have somebody validating it by saying that you they believe in your writing so much that they think that you can both get paid for it, and that is awesome. But if a manager can't or won't help you progress in your career, you'd honestly be better waiting up to sign with somebody who can't. So um, there are plenty of reps out there who aren't well-connected at all, and it's something to pay attention to. There are some who just don't have that much hustle, and they'll like sign people on the off chance that they might make them some money. There are others who are actually excellent at what they do, but they have a large roster of clients and they spend most of their time with the people who are the most successful. And while that's like logical to some degree, it's a bad thing for the writers at the bottom of the priority list. And finally, and probably the most common, there are great reps out there who just might not be a great fit for you. Um, and that's a real thing. So again, it may be a while before you're here, but what you're looking for in a rep is somebody who's like ultra passionate about, you know, your work and what you write because that means that they'll be driven to get it out there. And, ex and you also want somebody who's extremely well connected because that means that they have the ability to do that. If they give great notes on top of it, it's a beautiful thing. So how do you find these people? Um, getting reads is roughly the same, whether you're going after reps, producers, executives, or otherwise. Uh, there are lots of different ways to make it happen and ranked roughly in order. The effective ones include the following. So knowing someone is obviously the best and the easiest. Uh, if you've got a connection, who might be a good fit for the material. That's a fantastic place to start. I realize that's not most people. Um, it certainly wasn't me when I was starting out, but that's okay. Meeting somebody in person and managing to establish a connection is also pretty effective. It's less common, it does happen. If you meet someone and happen to talk about what you're working on and they happen to spark to the log line, they might ask to read it. And if they do and it's ready, send it. Um, just know that if they don't ask and they and you have mentioned that log line, it probably means that they don't want to read it. And if you are in the process of developing a, a relationship there or a connection, um, you may not want to burn that by asking for a read and just making them feel annoyed in the process. Uh, referrals are the bread and butter of the industry. Knowing people who can refer you to the right person is everything, which is why I have spent a good deal of time talking about the importance of getting to know people. The top tier contests and services out there can be very effective for a select few people who do well on them. It's worth noting that they're also an easy way to spend a lot of money and get nothing in return. I will talk more about that in a second. Query letters can be uh, effective, they're free. There are a lot of people who just automatically delete them because they get so many, but among those who don't, there's a real possibility that a great query can get you a read. And then uh, finally, social media can be a great way to get reads if you use it effectively. And the upside is it has a broader reach than many other methods, and it's also free. Every once in a while, someone finds an unorthodox method of getting read. You have to be careful here because more often than not, that person just ends up looking crazy or desperate and merely succeeds in like ensuring that nobody will read them again. So I'm not saying like don't think outside the box here because sometimes that can work, but just like proceed with caution. Um, let's see, pausing. So Carol, um, why don't we, why don't you save that question for the end? Cause you'll, you'll talk to um, a few people who are, who have been repped and we can talk about that in more detail. Uh, Mitchell, I'll talk about that blacklist and cover fly in a second. Uh, our producer is going to want to know what other projects you have, unless you write something gold in the first try. I mean, like a producer is looking for the next project that they're going to invest a couple years of their life into. So if they like your writing, but like that script isn't for them, yes, they're going to want to know what's next, like, or what else you have. But like, if they love the script that they get, that's all they're going to care about. And they're going to want to do that thing. It's not common for things to work out that way, but like you have to, you, that's why you have to kind of cast a wide net and get it out there as much as you possibly can. Um, so going a little bit deeper on like some of the screenwriting services, um, there are countless places online that will like take your money in exchange for offering you the key to your dreams. Most of them have absolutely zero ability to deliver on it. Uh, many are offering you things that you honestly don't even need. Uh, for instance, like I've said before, I think that in most cases, writers don't really need to pay for feedback. Sometimes it can be helpful, uh, but in those less common instances, you should really only be paying for feedback from people who have a lot of experience in the context of the actual film industry. And that is not most of the people who are reading for most of these services. And the reason for that is because most of these services, pretty much all of them, are not the industry. They're adjacent to it. There are a few that I think are worthwhile, depending on where you're at and what your financial position is. So the blacklist is a big part of why Aftermath got made. If you do well there and have a great logline, 
you can get a ton of reads from people who are in the industry. That said, only 3% of the scripts score the necessary eight out of 10 or better. And you still need that killer hook and log line. And you are always going to have to contend with subjectivity, which means that you could also be throwing a couple hundred dollars out the window just like that. So again, you got to make sure that you're comfortable spending that money and that your script is already ready. Uh, Roadmap Writers, it offers courses and coaching that are you know very well respected by a number of great writers I know. I also have connected with a couple people at the top, including their CEO. I feel very confident in saying that they're truly in it to help writers succeed. Um, they have helped a number of writers get signed by managers, like 300 or something. Um, I will be honest, some of those relationships haven't worked out great, but many of them have. Um, and there are a number of writers who got their first break that way and went on to have real success. That said, Roadmap is also super pricey, so you gotta make sure that you're ready for that investment if you use them. Coverfly has paid services, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily vouch for, but they also have a lot of free services that I think are fantastic. Uh, these include like giving you an online space to host your scripts, things like their Pitch Week and Coverfly X. If you score well in contests, some of those get tracked by Coverfly and you can get onto their red list, which can potentially get you some reads. I made the red list, I never saw anything come out of it. Um, but either way, I recommend setting up a profile there and taking advantage of it because again, it's free. Um, there are probably several hundred like screenwriting contests out there, maybe more. Most of them are super meaningless unless um, you know, you're simply looking for maybe validation or like a measuring stick of where you're at and that's fine. But in my opinion, um, you know, most of them are not worth entering um, because they just are a way to burn money and they won't be able to do anything for you. There are a few that are actually really worthwhile. Um, but again, those are also expensive and you have to recognize for that for those you are up against people who are basically writing at a professional level already. So your work needs to be there. Um, when you're ready, the contests I recommend are nickel page script pipeline in Austin. There are a few others that have a handful of success stories too, such as big break and cine story. But you know, by the time you get to that point, you're probably talking a few hundred bucks per script per year. So I would really just limit it to the few that matter. Um, and honestly, I really want to stress too, you don't need to spend a dime on any of this stuff. Like, again, like contests and services are like fourth on that list that I made. There are other ways to break in that are often more effective, but these are opportunities. So, you know, if it's something that you want to explore, these are the places that I would check out. The Nickel Fellowship really does matter. Um, even if you're merely a quarter finalist there, that can be enough to earn you some reads. You can put that kind of thing in a query letter um, with Page, Script Pipeline, and Austin, you need to kind of be a finalist or better for it to be meaningful. This means being in the top few of what are often several thousand entries. And again, readers can't help but be subjective. So like, you need to be amazing and you also need to be a little bit lucky. But if you are, um, the contest can be meaningful too. And you'll get read by real managers, real producers, and people do get signed and land options out of these every single year. Uh, with query letters, you can find the email addresses for many people right on IMDb Pro. Um, again, like I, I would approach these like somebody that you don't know who is super busy and has an overflowing inbox because that is the case. So you need to keep it short and snappy, get to the point quickly. The point of your query letter is your log line. It needs to be amazing. It needs to hook people from the start. If you can hook somebody, you might get a request. Ultimately, I recommend keeping query emails to quick three paragraphs, a quick intro, uh, letting them know why you're emailing them and who you are. Um, this should be personalized to them so that they know it's not just a mass email. Next, um, your title, genre, and log line. And then finally, a quick closing paragraph that sums up a bit about who you are as a writer. Um, if you have like a fascinating background or uh, especially if it relates to your script, share that here. If you've had a major contest placement or a successful short film or something similar, also share that here. Then you thank them for their time and you, you get out. Uh, importantly, never send an attachment with a query. You always want to wait until they request the script. Um, social media is great if you use it effectively. By that, I mean that you use it to connect with people in a real and meaningful way um, to establish your online brand as the kind of person that people want to work with. Um, so like, you occasionally might update people on what you're working on. If you have a big win, whether a literal win in a contest or like an eight on a blacklist, 
a contract that you signed, a short film that's taking off, announcing that type of thing in a way that people will engage with it can work really well and that's helped me in the past. Um, that said, you can hurt yourself on social media if you come across as cynical or desperate. Uh, suddenly you become like a writer that nobody wants to work with. Uh, and the thing is, as I've learned many times, you really never know who's watching. So I just had a general meeting this week with two pretty notable producers. Um, and one of them uh, knew who I was already because he had seen me posting on Reddit uh, with my real name. I'd never met him before. He just knew who I was and had seen what I'd posted there over time. And I found myself kind of praying like that everything he'd seen had reflected well on me. <laughs> And uh, one of the stars in Aftermath told me on set that he'd been watching my YouTube, which shocked me because like only a couple thousand people have ever seen it. Um, but apparently he was one of them. So it was a great reminder that you got to be conscious of what you're putting out there. Um, but then again, Aftermath probably wouldn't have gotten made if I hadn't posted about it on Twitter. Um, and if I, uh, another one of mine has producers attached because of Twitter as well. And I signed with my current manager again because of another writer who saw me posting on Reddit using my real name. He knew I was looking for reps. He didn't know me, but he had seen enough of what I'd posted that he felt comfortable making a referral, and that's where things went. So um, truly, social media can be a great tool. Just, you know, you never know who's watching. Um, oh, it's 2.11 already. All right, so uh, real quick, Dave and Jason, <laughs> uh, if you're watching, I've got like five, ten more minutes here before I'm going to pull you in. Uh, I told them that I was going to be ready for Q&A by now, but I guess I've been answering some questions along the way and uh, talking more than I expected. So anyway, let's keep going. Um, so when you do finally get reads from reps and producers, uh, they may ask you to sign a release form. This is not uncommon. Uh, what it does is protect them in the event that they're already working on something similar to your script. Uh, and you happen to assume that it was theft instead of parallel development and try to sue them. Uh, this kind of thing has happened often enough that many people feel forced to protect themselves, so it's a thing. Um, that said, you should make sure to read every release form, um, ensure its terms make sense to you. Don't sign any actual rights away, please. Uh, but ultimately for me, if it's a reputable company or person, I typically sign them. If not, I might choose not to move forward with sending them the script if they really need it. So uh, let's say you've gotten some read requests and you've sent your script and you can't wait to hear you know, uh, what they think, but they're not getting back to you nearly as quickly as you would like. That is the norm. Uh, these people have dozens of scripts on their plate. Their primary job is probably not reading yours. It's gonna take some time. Um, so you can follow up though. Uh, personally, I like three weeks as a time frame. you know, or at the very least I want like three weekends to pass because the weekends tend to be when people read. Two weeks is too few. Uh, but also it's possible that they've forgotten about my script and the hustle and bustle of life and work. Uh, and so I don't usually want to wait a whole month. So I'll send a quick email that says, you know, I hope you're well. Just wanted to check in and see if you had a chance to read XYZ. Looking forward to your thoughts. And that's it. Unfortunately, the most common response to a read is rejection, uh, especially with our earlier scripts. Uh, that's the case. It takes a long time to get good at this. Um, we shouldn't take rejection personally, but it's often hard not to after pouring so much of ourselves into our work. And I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of passes I've had at this point. There have been a lot of them. Um, often I don't even hear back. That is super common. Uh, people don't like to say no in this business. And so they often just don't say anything at all. It sucks. It is what it is. I do think rejections have become easier over the years, but occasionally they do still sting. Uh, have gotten comfortable with it though. And that's important because it's part of the process. So most reps only sign a few new clients a year. Most production or producers only make a few movies a year. They may not know what they're looking for until they see it, but they're definitely looking for something specific. And if that's not your script, it doesn't actually mean it was bad. It doesn't even mean that they didn't like it. It just means it wasn't the thing for them. So ultimately, keep at it. Um, it is important for us to interrogate whether there's more work to be done to improve our scripts when we get passes. But occasionally, there really isn't a whole lot more to do. And in that case, the only thing to do is to keep sending it out and to keep writing more material. The more you write, the more people you meet, the more at-bats you get. Um, and it's why I've talked so much about tenacity and perseverance and that long-term mindset. Ultimately, it really only takes one yes to get some real momentum behind a project. And that's important to keep in mind. And also, something that I've really learned over and over again if one person in the industry loves your script, there are more who will too. Uh, for me, 
The ultimate proof of that was, you know, how Aftermath was optioned in 2012, completely fell apart, and then it broke me in all over again in 2021 uh, and became a movie. So, you know, it took forever, but for every bit of like work and rejection that I did, experienced along the way, um, you know, every hardship along the way, all of it was ultimately worth it for an opportunity to step on set and see this thing that I created come to life. So my hope is that if you found a love for this through this class, you'll also stick with it and get to experience the very same thing someday. So that is it for the course. I hope you feel it's been worth this very big investment of your time. I hope you're super proud of the work that you've done. I have certainly felt like a lot of pride in watching so many of you put the work in uh, and having very like real important uh, revelations along the way about story. I've seen you forming groups, coming together to support each other. It's been super rewarding. I cannot thank you enough for being a part of it. It's been, it's been awesome. Um, so like I said on the first class, this is a graded course. Uh, so if you've finished your script already, take a minute to grade yourself. Uh, the deadline is technically next Saturday. So if you're still trying to get it done, go ahead and wait until then. Um, but if you completed your first draft, give yourself 60 points right off the bat. If you completed that short script at the beginning, give yourself another five points. You should have read 12 scripts during this course. For each one you read, you get 2.5 uh, points up to a total of 30. And finally, if you sent out messages to pro writers in an attempt to set up a copy or a Zoom or a phone call, regardless of whether it actually happened or not, give yourself a final five points. And if you scored above a 90 or above, uh, please let me know in the chat. I really wanna hear about that. So uh, a final note, uh, the grading part is for fun. It's meant to be a motivator. If you do finish that script, even if it's not in time, you have absolutely zero to feel bad about. It's a really big deal, no matter what. Um, in fact, I hope you feel like great about it. Uh, but I am going to encourage you to stick with it and get it done. So a final and brief uh, reminder about the cost of the course here. So first, please do the work. Uh, if you finish the work, there is a single assignment remaining for you. If not, finish the work, do the script. You will be so glad that you did. Two, uh, these videos are coming down in late February. If you found them valuable, please do share them so that other people can take advantage. Um, third, it's a free course. It's meant to be that way. If you do feel inclined to tip, those tips have been very much appreciated. You can do so at nate-davis-64 in Venmo or nathangramdavis at Gmail on PayPal. And uh, that's the thing. So let's talk about the final assignments. Uh, they're easy. Finish the script. Grade yourself if you haven't already. Set actionable writing goals for 2024. These should be things uh, that you have total control over, like write 45 minutes each day or do three rewrites on your current script uh, and maybe a first draft on another if you have the time. Uh, I don't love the idea of setting time-oriented goals around things that require the subjective action of another person. So like getting a manager or selling a script. Those are great long-term goals, but like if you set a deadline around them, I find they can be demoralizing because you don't control those things. Finally, after you finish, take the rest of 2023 off um, and congratulations on finishing that script. So it is Q&A time. This is gonna take me a second here, um, but uh, I'm super excited to announce uh, two people joining me today. So they are, oops, sorry. I knew I was gonna screw this up. They are Jason Gruich and David L. Williams, um, two writers who inspire me constantly and who I've become really close with over the years. Oh, my manager's calling. I put this on Do Not Disturb, but he gets through. I'll talk to Spike later. Um, so, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I've become really close with uh, Dave and Jason over the years, uh, and I'm going to let them introduce each other as soon as this works. Let's see if this works. One second. Dave and Jason, can you guys turn your cameras on for me if you're watching? Hold on. There's Dave. Nice. Dave, can you speak? And people can you, who are watching, can you let me know if you can hear him? Um, because this is doing this like group Zoom thing or uh, whatever is brand new to me. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Sweet. I can hear Dave. Can, can you hear me? Hear Dave? 
Um, there will be like a Jason 10 second Garrett. delay there. Uh, got gotcha. you. And then is Jason having technical difficulties? I heard oh, Jason. There's Jason. All right, sweet. All right, cool. All right, so we can hear Dave. I'm going to assume we can hear Jason. Um, I think there were yep. a few questions up there that I didn't get to yet. So let me look at those first. Um, and if I if I skipped one, just go ahead and ask them again, everybody. Um, they're going to be with us for a bit here, and they're excited to answer your questions. But first, I'm going to let these guys introduce oh, yeah. each other. Um, why don't we start with uh, Dave introducing Jason, and then we'll let you guys flip. <laughs> so, uh, man, where do I begin? So Jason Gruage. Uh, has been writing for roughly 10 years. I want to say early 2010s. Uh, I think his wife bought him Final Draft a long time ago. <laughs> so, so we're digging way back. Uh, he wrote some scripts that got some attention on the Blacklist website. I think one of them was called The Tempering, if I'm not mistaken. That led to like a, a little bit of, you could say like maybe a modicum of, um, of, uh, of, of, of attention um, and led to some interesting avenues, but nothing necessarily super significant but uh, he got some bites made a little bit of money um but was still very hungry was still very passionate and extremely hard working <clears throat> and then i say about 2015 he and i became uh, besties in like you know, we met on a on a peer review website and realized that we shared like i don't know six movies that were top 10 favorite movies of all time and loved the same kind of music and and uh, just became best friends like we like from from there like and then in 20 when is, do i skip the 2019 i mean we also like went to the awesome film festival in 2016 we also took a trip to los angeles uh earlier that year just kind of impromptu to meet up in person but you know for as far as jason in 2019 he oh actually before i do that so jason was was involved with someone who kind of was a manager i feel like um nate did a little bit of, of warning about the kind of people that are out there but he was involved with this producer manager who was you know it was a somewhat nefarious dynamic and the guy had you know he wanted certain kind of movies to get made and uh he did a poor job at like getting jason's stuff out there and and all that jazz. It's it's a long story, very in depth, very nuanced experience, but one that we both learned from. Ironically, Jason did get a movie made out of it, but um, you know, he he, it, I feel like he's kind of indifferent about that movie, so I'll let him talk about that. But um, but it really when when things get really exciting in 2019, when Jason wrote a script called Cop Can, and what's cool about our relationship is that we've been there from like the littlest of inklings and seeds from you know when we first get an idea and when we even like when we write like one page or something and i remember when he wrote the first two pages of cop cam and that was he only had two pages and i read those two pages and i was like man this is this is pretty butter i'm not gonna lie to you man this is pretty outrageous how good this is uh but man he wrote that script so quickly and then he submitted it i don't know if people here have heard of uh script shadow um, you know, for, for all its faults and, and it's a very, it's a somewhat divisive website, but, um, there are, you know, it's so funny how Carson himself sometimes feels like the least toxic element of that website. With that said, um, he, you know, Carson, Script Shadow is basically run by this dude named Carson who calls himself Carson and he reviews, you know, screenplays that are kind of making the, you know, that are kind of circling the industry whether they're about to get made and they can be written by anyone all the way from tony gilroy to brand new writers like he's rating very objectively on the same scale and so jason's script cop cam got like second highest rating which is super rare on that website and it was a really exciting time and it led to i mean everything's happened so quickly you know that went it went from that to like to jason suddenly had a meeting with good fear like i think the following week I, I think within the following week, and they Good signed him immediately. Uh, management company, uh, just for kind that's of man, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So that's a management company. They, um, you know, they're they're okay, uh, especially in hindsight. But uh, but they're you know they are very well respected and, and stuff like that. And they signed him, and and man, within like 
a week or two, he got a huge offer from the studio. I'm just going to say it. It was New Line Cinema. I don't think we really care about keeping it under wraps anymore. He's, he, he sold six figures uh, sale of that script to New Line, which is just mind-boggling. And I mean, I can't – that had to be top – at the time, I think top three, top five happiest I've ever been in my life, <laughs> happiest days. So um, just watching your best friend who you talk to every day who, you know, whom you you – read the you read when he only had two pages i read those two pages and go you know going from there to it's selling to a studio it's just such a surreal experience and so yeah he he sold that script and then you know good fear they initially they they tried to get jason stuff out there and all that jazz but then 2020 happened and it was a very unfortunate uh time because not only was there the pandemic but also um, full disclosure, he used to be a police officer, um, very good at his job, very well respected and stuff like that. And 2020 was, um, it was a tough year to be a black person and also frankly, to be a white cop. So, <laughs> um, and this is coming from a black guy and I'm, I'm very open about being very objective in favor for both sides. So, um, it, they, you know, Good Fear kind of runs, they operate like they're pretty, if things aren't, if they don't see a sale in like, you know, like yesterday, they can have a hard time pushing stuff out there. But anyway, long story short, Cop Cam is set up. And then I I think, it, you know, granted, it was through Good Fear that Jason met this other like badass like producer who like has made like a bunch of stuff. He's like behind Mortal Kombat and a bunch of other things. And he pitched to him to write something on spec. He crushed that pitch. Um, he crushed the script, did several drafts. Now there's a director attached. And now he has this uber, like, a, like super well-loved producer, big-time producer attached to the script. And they they literally, as of, like, a few weeks ago, uh, no, what am I talking about? Uh, maybe a few months ago. Oh, no, the strikes kind of delayed everything. So, like, in a way, kind of like a couple months ago, started really taking it out. And it's just a really exciting time for Jason for so many reasons. Um, since then, he's also signed with uh, with Nick Light as well. So hopefully, you know, I, I gave you a good idea of the full spectrum of the the peaks and valleys of, of Jason's career. But um, it's literally it, it it's only going to get better. And yeah, his twenty twenty four is going to be big. I think. Oh, it's going to be a, it's going to be disgusting how good it is. I mean, it's just going to be so gross. Um, <laughs> so keep an eye out, man. Seriously, if, if you if people really it also. I didn't even get into real quick. I, I don't want to go on too long, but I didn't even get into like just how talented the dude is. Like his writing style is just so unmistakable, and just so like when you read a Jason Grud script, it's like what the what is happening? What am I? What the fuck am I looking at? I'm just, true, I don't know. If cursing's loud in this. It's it's ridiculous. Like the dude's gift and his vision when he writes and just. Man, I, I I really can't put into words just how good, how great of a, a talent he is, and just how lucky Good Fear was to have him, and how lucky his current manager is, and um, and anyone who interacts with him is just like blown away. Anyway, so he's also just a really great dude. So now you have a great writer with a unique writing style who's also a great dude. Um, it's kind of the complete package and then some. So, um, man. Uh, Jason's Jason's that dude, man. Uh, I, I'm trying to think. I'm sure I can think of more things, but I'd be here all day if I did that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty good. man, I hope I did. I hope I did him justice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jason, you want to introduce your best friend, Dave? Sure. Yeah. So Dave is uh, one of my best friends on the planet, and he is required to say all that wonderful stuff about me. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that was very long, but uh, but uh, I thank you, Dave. Um, but yeah, I met Dave. I think it's important to, especially a lot of what Nate was talking about in this this episode, it, the networking part of it. Um, I was from I'm from Biloxi, Mississippi, on the Gulf Coast, and when I started writing, I didn't know a single person anywhere that had anything to do with film or writing or anything. Sat down, bought a few books, wrote the first script, and then it was, like most of you, I'm sure, it's how do I get it out there? Who do I meet? What do I do? Um, and then fast forward about a year or two later, uh, trying different routes and avenues, not really meeting anybody. I'm you know, isolated in uh, Biloxi. 
I entered a, I got onto a peer review website and where you could share scripts with each other and review them and give feedback. And that's where I met Dave. It's just kind of a random encounter. We shared each other's scripts. Uh, we ended up in the chat, just kind of shooting the bowl. And like within 10 minutes, we were, it felt like we were best friends. You met like a kindred spirit. We would share songs, movies, scripts, writing. All we did was talk about movies. And we've been talking through chat. He lives in LA. I'm still in Biloxi right now. And for the last uh, almost 10 years, it's been a daily conversation in the chat, which has improved both of our writing because we play a lot. We try to, you know, outmatch each other. We try to make each other laugh. And then, you know, Nate and a bunch of other friends came on a lot later than that. And we're all very, very tight. But Dave, uh, I've, been in the day, I've been in the trenches with Dave, like he was saying, um, you know, almost 10 years when we didn't even know what we were doing. Uh, we just kept trading ideas, scripts. They were most were bad. We had a lot of feedback on each other, but we kept at it. We kept inspiring each other to move forward. Uh, that Dave had, you know, we, he had some producers reach out to him that weren't on the up and up, that were um, trying to take advantage, you know, and no pay and lots of free work. And you're going to encounter that stuff. But ultimately, fast forward all the way after my 2019 happened, uh, Dave wrote a script called Clementine. And this is, Dave can tell you, but this is probably 30 or 40 or 50 scripts in. He's been writing much longer than me and has stuck with it. And just like Dave said about me with CopCam, it was equally one of the best days of my life when Clementine finally blew up. And the way he did it, I'll, I'll make it short, but we were hanging out one night and we said, let's blow some money on the Blacklist website and see if we can get an eight, you know, like with a couple of script ideas. And he put Clementine up there and it got a nine, I think first, and then it got an eight and another eight. And it just kind of exploded to this point where everybody that was reading it on the blacklist, I think he got up to seven reviews, rated it super high. And what Dave did with that, that's good in itself because they send it out to the industry. But what Dave did was got on social media, like Nate was saying, and really hustled and used it to his advantage to raise awareness about the script and what it had done and what it had accomplished. And before he knew it, managers are hitting him up in his DMs, can I read it? Uh, and it just, he kind of took off from there. He he met with a few, and then he ended up signing with uh, Gramercy Park, Mitchell ben, uh, Bendersky. That was in late 2021. I think he signed on Christmas Eve when the industry shut down. Um, and then top of the following year, uh, Mitchell started sending it to places. They kept hustling. He got his agents at Verve. Uh, and ultimately ended up, I think the agents come on after he optioned it, but he optioned, he signed an option agreement with that script that's still active and it's got attachments and it's moving forward fast. And next year, hopefully is the year it goes into production. But 2022, all of that happened for Dave and he had over a hundred general meetings. Uh, I can't tell you how many OWAs he was put, uh, open writing assignments he was put in for, pitches he gave to studios and capped off that year, uh, being on the blacklist, the annual, the annual blacklist, um, which was huge. So we all had a big party. We watched the announcements live and it was just a super fun day when your buddies, when you rise up together, you know, through all the trenches and heartache and the roller coaster that all of this is, it's really gratifying to see your buddies make it. Um, and he's off to the races. I mean, he's next year is going to be huge for Dave just as well. Yeah, uh, it is. And I, I really, I can't say enough um, about how serious I am when I say that like, these are two writers who, inspire me we kind of have this like running joke with like you know when i read something from them like my i get pissed because like it's so good and i'm like why am i even doing this anymore and i'm ready to quit and then like you know an hour later i'm like fired up and i'm like i'm gonna beat them with my next script and you know it's it's like it's like a really like fun uh thing to like have a couple friends like that who just inspire you in that way they're they're great writers great dudes um but anyway this is a Q and A. So um, now that you know a little bit about them, I'm gonna go and scroll up to a couple questions here, and then we'll just keep it rolling. Um, and I see in the comments a couple Clementine fans here. Uh, your friendship sounds like a Pixar story. Love it. <laughs> right. It kind of is, man. We could go on forever about that, but yeah. Uh, let's see. So, what is your advice on writing better complex characters that come alive? Ooh, Jason, you, I feel like you should take that one. Okay. At least uh, first. <laughs> that, well, so for me, that's a great question. That's a fantastic question. I, 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 when I started, I was always, I'm a, I'm a big action writer. So I, I would focus in my earlier days. And I'm always learning, by the way. I don't know everything either. Just like Nate said, we're all, we're all trying to figure it out as we go and hope we get lucky and 
have those opportunities. But when I started, I would focus heavily on being the best action writer I could be in, you know, the shortest amount of words. So my character work would sometimes suffer for that. They wouldn't be, that, those are the notes and the feedback I would get. Your characters feel one dimensional. I don't really care about them. Why should I care if he's in a foot chase with the bad guy, whatever it is. But to answer the question, what I've started doing years into writing, it, it, it took me a while. It took me personally a while to figure it out. Some people get it faster. Dave is certainly better at it than me. Is coming up with, you hear it all the time, you know, giving your characters a bio, or their bio. Who are they? It doesn't have to make it in the script, but you have to know who that character is as a human being. Like they exist in your brain, they're real. And you have to feel like you know them, like the back of your hand. Who who raised them? How were their parents? Where did they go to school? Did they go to school? Were they criminals? Were they not? Did they overcome things in their past? And the more you can get around that headspace and who that, especially your protagonist and your antagonist, <laughs> Uh, the more it's going to uh, inform the dialogue and their actions, and more importantly, their choices. Um, and, and that's always a struggle. Every new script is the same struggle. Who are these people? How do I make them leap off the page to make you, when you're reading it, feel like it's an actual person that I'm writing about versus somebody I just made up? You know, Dave, Sweet you want to jump in on that? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, two things that come to mind for me when for complex characters i think number one is um some form of authenticity i think if you can because i feel like it's my personal belief that the the majority of people you meet in real life are experts at something so if you have a character that is like an expert at something very niche or is very passionate about something very specific not that your characters have to you know exhibit that in the script and they're able to come through but like I don't know. It just it just feels like the more like for instance, um, I remember um, reading a review of of the screenplay for a Quiet Place, and there's that scene where the two kids are stuck in that silo. I think it's like a corn silo. I don't know something like that. And the way the way that it's described in the script is just so specific and authentic that that really stood out to the reader. I think those things are very very helpful because you know, and also those characters have a deep knowledge of you know, that process and what they use the silo for and all that jazz. So um, I think authenticity can do wonders for, for creating complex characters. I also think the other thing is um, just real life experience, um, just experiencing what it's like to interact with other human beings and people and, and, and just being observational and, and keeping tabs, whether it's, you know, inadvertent or not, you know, uh, cause I feel like I do that just by, by accident half the time, to be honest, but uh, just kind of, just kind of, you know, having that stuff, bubbling underneath and then having it rise for when you're writing a character i feel like roughly 33 percent of the characters i write are are at least inspired by people i've met in real life honestly so it's kind of a cheat code it's almost like real life is, cheat, is a cheat code for for writing those complex characters that's great um what script did you read uh or, or what script uh that you read changed the way that you viewed screenwriting oh um Ooh. I have an answer. For me, probably Lethal Weapon back in the day. Oh, that's a good one. 10, 12 years ago. Um, that's the one that leaps out. I mean, I've read so many about Nightcrawler. Um, every new script I read, whether it's from a, a produced movie or a peer or a beginner or an amateur or a uh, professional, whoever it may be, there's always that possibility. That's why you should read everything in as much as you can. Because every time you read something, you're going to get re-inspired in a different way. And if you're not reading a ton, I mean, there's all you have to, you know, you have to manage your time, you have to market, you have to write, obviously, and then read a ton. And the more you read, the more you're going to come across things that are going to uh, really change the way that you think about the script. Um, people get hung up, especially on Twitter, formatting and, you know, can I do this or can I not do that? Know the rules, know how, there's no rules, but know how a screenplay looks. Read a ton, look how it looks, and then go from there. And then just get feedback and keep tweaking that. Like you can do what you want to do and write how you want to write. Like there are no limits. But like for me, when I started, I, I read, I think it was, uh, I forgot what the books were. It was two or three intro to screenwriting books. I knew all the rules. And I sat down and I wrote my script based on the rules. But then I would read something like Nightcrawler and I went, hold up. You know, this dude is really, like that character is just alive. And so I would go back to the next thing and try to tweak the way that I thought about the rules and um, all that other stuff. So I hope that answered the question. I think that's a good answer. 
we got a lot of questions. So that was, that was, yeah, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep them short. That's a really good answer. I think, Night yeah, I mean, Jason brought up, I think, the best possible example, which is Nightcrawler, which is like one of those scripts I've that. I've never read Nightcrawler you, now. In like, a way, All right, I better get to this. <laughs> Dude, the formatting makes you wonder how they shot it, to be honest. But, like, you can't recommend that script to writers, especially not newer writers. But at some point in your journey, you should check out Nightcrawler. Well, yeah. writers um, I think for me, at least 12, and many of them a lot more than that at this point. So, right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then, you know, have at it and, and uh, very, very curious what they would think. But um, I think for me, the script that did it for me was uh, Raising Arizona is a script that always comes to mind from yeah. the Coen brothers. And there's nothing really fancy. As a matter of fact, in a way, it's just like it, the, form the formatting and everything is just so, the presentation of the script is just so impeccable to the point where it doesn't really do anything unique, but it's just the story itself and the way that the characters are presented and described and what, how they're, it was just such a cinematic read for me. It was such a, such a fast cinematic read where I could so clearly see the characters on screen that it really, that's for me, and this is back in like 2010, by the way, for me, this is when I realized that um, you don't necessarily want your screenplay to read off like a screenplay. You want it to feel like a movie. And that makes a huge difference for people when reading a script because they're, they're going to read a lot of scripts, but when you read something that feels like a movie, it's that's what makes, that can literally be the difference between a, between a sale and not, or between yeah. an option and not, uh, because producers are not in the business of making screenplays, they're in the business of making movies. Um, so th I would say Raising Arizona is what really, is when it really clicked for me not necessarily like you know it didn't click for me like skill wise because that took a long time I, I do it took me a lot of screenplays frankly to do that but i think when it came to the intent when i was writing that's when it really changed for me was after reading that script sweet um i'm gonna do this one i think it's useful to have both of you talk about and then i'll probably like hop around and like assign you guys questions just because i see a bunch of them coming in i want to make sure we get to as many as possible and also respect your time um but because you'll have probably different answers. How important is it to be based in the U.S. or L.A. in particular? Um, short answer is, if you're a feature writer, it doesn't matter. That's that's my belief. Um, I, I still live in Biloxi, Mississippi. I travel to L.A. plenty, um, but I write mostly features. So I, I broke in and did it all from here. Um, it's not easy. It's not, it's not easy if you live in L.A. or in the U.S. or outside of the U.S. No matter where you're at, it's not going to be easy. But for me... Um, yeah, on the TV side, if you're looking to get staffed into a, a writer's room, it, it it makes it easier. I mean, you probably have to be in L.A. for a lot of those jobs. There's some, I'm sure, that can do it on Zoom, but I think they like people to be local when they're shooting them, wh wherever that may be, L.A., New York. But, yeah, if you're a feature writer, you can do it from anywhere. You just it's, you just have to be creative in how you get your stuff out there. I mean, Dave's got Dave's got fellow writers that are repped at Verve with him and have that live – abroad you know all over the place all over the world same thing with good fear good fear has clients from russia from everywhere so yeah it doesn't matter i wouldn't get hung up on that do you want to expand on that at all that dave or oh yeah so i mean yeah no he mostly uh jason mostly nailed it if you're a feature writer the, the odds are it's not going to matter the only time it will really matter as a feature writer for it in for instance i had like and I, I, I hate to say this because it sounds like I'm bragging, but I had over 100 generals in 2022. Uh, about two or three of them were in person. Like, they're, you know, the per, the exec's first instinct, instinct was to meet in person. They didn't even, like, offer a Zoom. Um, and so I think for, a, 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 like, a handful of execs, I mean, probably more than that, probably a lot more, um, they they do prefer to have that face-to-face -face in, in person um it just makes you more flexible if you're in the states and especially in los angeles as a feature writer to meet people but frankly to like get anything made to succeed and to get paid no it does not matter where you are if you're writing features if you're writing tv though then that's a very different story um even being in anywhere in the u.s isn't necessarily enough uh rooms i you know, I don't think there are a lot of rooms right now that are just Zoom. I know that there are some, but a lot of them are back to being in the writer's room. And some are even hybrid. 
Um, so it's like, yeah, they're doing some Zoom, but they still want to meet with everyone in the office maybe once or twice a week. So, you know, if you're aspiring to be a TV writer, there's also the 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 notion and the the, the reality of um, kind of moving up the chain in TV writing. So, for instance, you can, like, if you, you know, some writers in the industry actually started off as, like, a writer's PA and then a writer's assistant and all that stuff. You can't do that unless you're in Los Angeles. <laughs> And then they eventually work their way up to. It's kind of insane to think that you could be promoted into being a writer. Um, that's it's kind of nutty, but you know, th there is a lot of writers in the industry who have done that. So you can't do that if you live outside the U.S. and live outside of L.A. So it's something to keep in mind on the for the TV writers out there. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. And the other thing I would say is is uh, all the stupid pictures you send us of parties and shit that you're at that yeah. neither of us can attend. Oh yeah. Honestly, like that, but, yeah, that's but a great it doesn't point. matter because like you get FaceTime with people that we just wouldn't get. You know what I mean? It makes and, it like, you establish work, yeah. connections on a different level because of that kind of thing. So it does it does that... matter. But like Jason and I have both been able to make some pretty cool things happen from way across the country. Um and like I have a friend, uh Matias Caruso, who lives in Argentina and is a WGA produced writer. So, you know, it, uh, if I can cool. expand on that for like if I can, if, if yeah, I can yeah, expand yeah. on it for like 10 or 15 seconds, because you brought up an excellent point, which I just completely forgot about. Yeah, I so like, if anything, it's, you know what it is, is for feature writers, LA can just be a bonus for you, really. But not being in LA won't hinder your success, but being in LA can be a huge bonus. So I, yeah, that's a great point. I've been to like parties. I went to an industry baseball game that was full of execs, and I was one of like maybe five writers. And I met people that I hadn't had generals with, like people from A24, people from like Warner Brothers and shit, and people I never even like met, despite all the generals I had. There were a ton of people that I hadn't met, but I, but I, my first time meeting them was at that Dodgers game. So you know that is a good point that you know if, if you want to expand your flexibility and abilities to meet people, it it can it can make it better if you live in Los Angeles, but I, I can't stress enough that as far as like breaking in and succeeding as a future, as a specifically a future writer, it doesn't really matter that much. It's just, you know, after you've broken in and after you've succeeded where it might actually matter a little bit more. Totally. Um, Jason, how do you, how do you uh, decide on the next project? Oh man, that's the age old question. Um, it just kind of, I, I read as much as I possibly can until something leaps out of me. I, I, it just, it's different every time. I don't really have a solid answer. I mean, I like to write in the gritty, authentic uh, kind of action space. I try to make everything compelling with, you know, twists and turns. So I, I kind of like to stay in the, like, I wouldn't, for me, I, I'm not going to consider writing a romantic comedy next because I like to write, you know, uh, true crime stuff or a little bit of sci-fi. I have a horror, like, it just depends um whatever the, the the last spec i wrote i was scrolling through uh twitter watching videos and there was a video of a robbery and it sparked an entire script and i banged it out in like a month so it just it depends like you know i'm always on the hunt you're out there fishing in the ether of what could be cool what kind of characters do i want to write about what what trouble can they get in and then base it on the genre you like to play with you know it could be a couple of things um a couple different genres and, and that's kind of how i it's not really a solid answer, but I just kind of keep my mind open and look at that next thing that way. Cool. Um, Dave, how do you manage conflicting reviews from the blacklist? Because I know that you did have a little bit of a range there, right? Uh, yeah, the website. Like, sorry, yeah, the that's, website, a, that's a great... Not, not the real blacklist that you're on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the website yeah. blacklist. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a super great question. I don't know, honestly. It really depends on... It depends on how varied the scores are. So, for instance, I got I definitely got the nine and I got the eight. I got a bunch of sevens. I got a six, and then randomly at one night at midnight when I was trying to sleep, I got a five from someone. Um, so, you know, how do you manage that? Um, honestly, the thing is, it's it's kind of indicative. Uh, it's you have to have the mindset that not everyone is going to jive the same way with your script. You kind of have to have the mindset that one, the most important score there is going to be the highest one. Um, so that's what you that's what you can use. That's what you can hustle. That's what people are going to care about. They only care about the high end, the ceiling, uh, per se. And so if you have that really high score, the lowest scores don't really matter, especially if you've got an eight or above. 
Um, and secondly, like there are instances in this industry, not everyone, people do love to like jump on trends, P you know, execs, they get FOMO, uh, people don't want to miss out, but it's, it's just going to happen where there's too many people in this industry to think that you can please everyone, not to mention audiences. Like say, if you get a movie made, you can forget about it. It's not going to happen. So it's kind of indicative of, of the mindset that you kind of need to have when you, when you're venturing into this industry that you're not going to, you know, you, you're, you can try to be as undeniable as you want, but, uh, and, you know, and maybe you can be, but you kind of just had to roll with every, you have to be prepared for every kind of feedback, honestly. So I, it's hard to, it's hard to, maybe, I don't know if I'm wording it the best way, but no, I think it's good. you just kind of, kind of have to roll with it. Um, Somebody's a run, run, run fan in here. I don't know who that is, but we got to know about that. Oh, um, hey. That was, that so, was script. Uh, the script. Talk about Twitter. Yeah. Got a, <laughs> yeah, so Jason's script, run, 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 is just this batshit crazy action script, and it's fantastic. Um, Jason, how do you, uh, like, write a scene that details the scope of a lot of atrocities without actually going into, you know, um, the weeds and detail on each individual one? Um, that's a good question. I would, I would, I guess I would have to be, I would need to know the specificity of the atrocities, if that makes sense. For an example, um, the producer that Dave mentioned that I've been working with for a couple of years now, he flat out told me one time, he's like, look, man, I know it's going to be a big action heist movie. He's like, you can write all of the crazy car chases you want. I'm not going to read them. They're all the same. Um, so with that in mind, instead of writing a five, maybe this helps with your question, instead of writing a five page, which I've certainly done, I love doing it, but sometimes you don't need it sometimes to condense and save pages especially during rewrites um go back to those big whatever it is it, it doesn't have to be action it could be an extended horror sequence or romantic whatever it may be and go back and figure out how in two sentences to say that word if that's not enough try three or four and i don't know if that answers the question but there's ways to describe like i have a friend a script i just read it was a big uh period piece like gladiator ben-hur type uh field battle and he pretty much summed it all up in half a page. Like, I got it. Both sides are on opposite ends of the mountain. They converge in the valley. There's bloodshed, swords clanging. And um, you get the you get the scope of it that way, you know, um, without having to really get into every specific minute action of every single extra, if that's what you mean, you know, cool. that you're right about. Chris, I'm going to answer your question real quick because it's an easy one. Uh, do I need to have somebody sign an NDA if I send a script? And the answer is no, do not do that. Uh, people will think you're crazy if you do. Um, like, it, it, it's not weird to feel a little bit paranoid about, like, uh, script theft if you're, like, a new writer or something like that. But the truth is that it really doesn't happen because studios are paranoid about getting sued over that kind of thing. And they'd much rather actually pay somebody for the rights. And, like, if they don't like the script but they like the idea, just pay you like the minimum and hire somebody else to do a rewrite than actually steal it. Like script theft is just not much of a thing. There are a, a handful of like maybe mythological, possibly slightly real stories out there, but in general it doesn't happen. And we all just send our scripts to whoever needs them because that's how you get them out there. Um, and, and you have to, otherwise you'll never get them read. Um, all right. Uh, Dave, was there a specific moment when you realized that you were actually good at this stuff? I love that question. It's a great question. Another another great question. Um, I want to say kind yes. So I I'm the kind of writer I've been writing so long that I I kind of put my experiences I kind of compart compartmentalize them into phases. You know, I had my phase where I was a newbie and I thought I was telling amazing, compelling stories. But frankly, those, those scripts were probably really unreadable. Then I got better as a writer, but my stories were stupid or something like that. So, And then I had a phase where I was decent, which is probably where I met uh, Jason, where I was like kind of decent. But like, you know, I wasn't making any any ground in like contests or anything at all. Um, so I, but the, I think the moment for me when I realized where I really felt like I that I was genuinely good is maybe when I wrote this script called Never Stops, um, which Jason is a, is a fan of, but it was like in 2017, so it took me a while. Um, I don't know. I think 
I think Jason had a lot to do with that because of his his response to that script. I'd never seen before. He had read a ton of my stuff before that, bless his soul. And his just the way he reacted to that script. And then so and, and what's funny is that like with scripts that I wrote after it, whenever I whenever I saw those indicators of how Jason responded to that script, and I saw those indicators in other scripts, I that's when I knew that it was a banger. And then in, in hindsight, I was like, oh yeah. That must have been the moment where I became like a really good writer. <laughs> when you get the wow, when you get the holy shit, dude. Wait, I, I have no notes. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Um, stuff like that is when you know when you get those consistently, especially from strangers who don't know you. Um, you're in a really good spot. So I would say it was like 2017 ish. I'm not saying every script I wrote from there was like great. You know, um, I wrote some some doozies, but uh, but I think it was like early 2017 for me. It was right after the the Austin Film Festival when I had decided I was going to move to LA and I wrote this other script. Um, and, but I, but I, yeah, never that script I wrote in early 2017 was kind of that moment for me because I started getting more of those. I started getting that feedback more often ever since then. And in like retrospect, I was like, that must've been the moment when I was like, I started getting really good. So I think that's it for me. That's cool. Um, Jason, uh, this is like a broad question. So maybe like just pick an aspect of it to talk about so we can keep moving to the other ones. Um, but, uh, What's your uh, writing process like? Is there anything that you've learned personally over the years uh, that sort of hacked the code for you in terms of storytelling? Oh, man. Um, so for me, my typical process, it changes every script, is I, I try to write a general, uh, you know, scribbled out uh, chicken scratch outline on a legal pad. I literally write the opening idea, the opening scene, the opening image, the, you know, this happens next at the midpoint, this is going to happen. And, I, and then at the end, I know how it ends. And that's kind of what happened for cop cam. I had the beginning, the middle and the end in my head. And then I sat down and, and it's different. Every script. I'm not saying do this for every script. Some people, uh, uh, there's another script I did that I did a five page complete outline with a treatment just to get a better sense. Cause it had more characters. I had to get a better idea of what it was before I started going into the, script software but for like cop cam i had the beginning middle and end and it was just a very simple in my head a simple concept straightforward i knew what the twists were going to be in the turns and i sat down in the script and all the characters just kind of came to me uh, as i started writing the first scene and it led to the next scene and it kind of dictated who was going to say what so i guess the simplest way to say it is that sometimes you got to just get in there and play around and write and don't worry about making a super polished final draft on your first go and a lot of times the characters you have in your head are going to end up coming alive uh, as you write the thing, whether it's in outline form or you go straight to a script. Dave, Dave will sit down and come up with a concept and he's banged out scripts in a week, two weeks and just go straight. And, and most of those are awesome. Um, because, I need a little more prep time. I like to get my head around. Makes me want to quit. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, Dave, Dave's very, very prolific. One of them, very imaginative. He's idea after idea. All of my friends have ideas that come every five minutes and I'm just like, dude, how do you come up with this? And yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's different every time. And I, I just sit down and play and sketch out things. And if something hits you and it's like, whoa, I got something here. Something's cool. And you tell your wife or your friend or your brother or your, whoever, your mom, um, and they go, Hey, you know, there's something that's, uh, that's Don watch that. Then you kind of start saying, okay, maybe I got something. And then sometimes it dies. Like a month later, you're halfway through. I have two or three scripts that are 50 to 80 pages in that I'm not going back to. I just, I, you know, left them, but that's just the process. You just sit down and keep scratching it out and you'll, you'll, you'll figure out kind of a routine. Some people like to write in the morning at night. Uh, I can write whatever, whenever I feel like it, um, whenever I'm inspired to go do it. But yeah, I mean, I had a day job for 10, 15 years while I was a writer. So I had to be very specific on when I sat down and did those things, um, at night, weekends, early morning, late at night, you know, you have to do what you can work with and just grind it out whenever you can. Um, hey, Dave, do you ever get stuck on a script? Uh, if so, do you step back and take a break or do you keep pushing forward until you have a solid draft down? I 100% step back. I am a, I am a practitioner. I am an aficionado of stepping the hell back and letting it make sense on its own. Sometimes you just, you let the story figure itself out. Like, I don't try to crash through the the writer's block wall. Um, it's it's super rare that I do because um, I I have done it, but I much prefer to like 
if I'm stuck, I just, yeah, I, I totally just step back. And I think, I think like what Jason said earlier about when he gets ideas, like they usually just come to him. It's kind of the same thing for me. And it's not just like concepts, but it's also how to break into on the sequence. Like I can have two sequences totally mapped out in my head, but getting from one to the other, I don't quite have sorted out. And so I might need to take a couple of days to, to let it kind of, stew and and um and then it'll come to me you know and then and then i'm ready to to write the next 20 pages or something so yeah i definitely i am a huge proponent of of uh stepping back don't i really don't i don't i don't believe in writers stressing themselves unless you are like getting paid and have a deadline if you're not in that situation you should you should be doing everything in your power to not stress yourself out nice uh, Jason, do you advertise your past employment as a cop, or do you let that come out naturally after meeting potential buyers? Um, well, I, I just recently signed with uh, a new manager right at the end of the strike. I was fortunate to kind of get on his radar, and he was a former fireman from New York City uh, after 9-11, which we had a very similar path into how I got into law enforcement after 9-11 and how he kind of went into the, a different direction of the fire department. But to answer the question, um, I mean, it's in my bio. Like, uh, he sent me out for some jobs and uh, submitted scripts to places, and it's in my bio, former law enforcement. Uh, based on the stuff that I write, it brings, um, you know, we agree that it brings a certain level of authenticity to what you're writing about. If you're a, whatever it is you do or like to do or your life experience, whatever that life experience you have is, it could be, you may think it's boring, but your life is different than everyone else's life. Figure out what the unique thing is and embrace that thing you know do you love people deeply are you easily hurt whatever it is like you have to think out your job is not your life so for me yeah that's an aspect that brings a certain level of authenticity to what i like to do and if it makes sense you know we'll say it if it doesn't we'll let it come out organically you know that's such a good answer because i think it also you kind of talked there about like the things that kind of make your voice your voice you know um which is right super yeah cool. so um Dave, this is a quick one. Did you walk the picket lines in L.A. during the strike? Uh, Herb Hall thinks that he may have met you there. If not, you have a doppelganger. <laughs> Me and Dave were together one day. At That's the right. Lines. There's a picture of that. So, so yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was there for – the answer is yes. I, I did for a, 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 a few days. I, I wanted to get out there more, but I do still have a day job, which I in all likelihood will probably end up quitting once Clemming Katan gets made this year, or in 2024, rather. But um, it so yeah that that held me back from from doing more days. I also wish I was able to get out there for SAG. I really wanted to 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 ride that picket line with, with SAG. But yes, I I was on the picket line for sure. <laughs> Sweet, um, Jason, did you ever have a case of people who wanted to make a movie from your script uh, had a different vision than you had when you wrote the script? And if so, how did you deal with it? Uh, let me think. I, I don't think so. Like, I guess the question is, how, did somebody come on board that wanted to change the entire vision of the script that basically they liked, that got the meeting? I don't think that's ever happened to me. There's always notes, always. Notes forever. The movie's on screen. You walk out, you're going to have notes. Um, but other than like a complete 180 on what I tried to do, I can't think of one. There may have been one or two. Um, but I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, other writers have different experience. I know Dave has, has, has had one or two where it's like, this is a great thriller. Let's make it a comedy, whatever, you know, he could tell you if he wants to about that, but yeah, I don't think so for me. I just haven't, I haven't uh, faced that. Yeah. I could, I could chime in. Yeah. Chime in. Yes. Um, I mean, nothing like super egregious and like urgent and earth shattering, but, uh, I definitely, I remember one time when I was meeting with a bunch of different managers, I met with one manager that suggested, even though he loved Clementine, he suggested like a page one rewrite. Um, and I was just like, why? And obviously I didn't, I ended, I didn't end up signing with that guy. But um, there, there was also, you know, um, I, I always, and maybe it's just a personal thing, but I just find like, you know, interacting with the directors can be so tricky because they they will always have notes, no matter how perfect they think their, your script is. Um, they will have notes because they want to match it to their vision. So when the producers of Clementine, I was very fortunate to meet with 
to be on those meetings when they were meeting other directors. And we, we had met about six or seven before we found what we felt was, was like the perfect fit. Um, a couple of them had, you know, some slight notes and a couple wanted to change the ending. Um, a couple of them wanted to change like some, like literally like four lines of dialogue. There was one guy who wanted to change the, like, quite a bit of things like the opening and, and all this other stuff. So yeah, you, you're going to, you might come across it. Um, I was very fortunate to be in a position where I, you know, one, the producers didn't want to change anything. And so whenever they heard that, they immediately were like, red flag, nope. Um, and also, I think a lot of times, because everyone on your team, like agents and the producers and your manager, they all have the same vision and they all want to, they want you to succeed. If they feel like those notes will not help you succeed, um, there is a reality where you are able to be like, no, we're not going to do those notes. Because a lot of times directors have to be very upfront with those things before they can get signed on to a project. Um, so it's it's pretty rare. I'm sure it happens, but I don't. I can't think of a case where we would have gone with a director and then suddenly they had notes um, that is kind of disingenuous and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, no, it, it happens. And and uh, I mean, your reps might even have that. Like I wrote a pilot last year that I thought was really funny and good. And my manager was like, no. <laughs> so, I mean, it happens. Um, so. Yeah, it happens. Uh, you know, I, I, I signed with my manager cause he, he really loved a couple of my scripts. Um, and, uh, you know, and we're pretty much, uh, he has some thoughts on a couple of them, but like those are basically staying the same. Another one of mine, which I was pretty sure was like 85% there. He read and he agreed. It was like 85% there, but in the process of talking through his thoughts on it and he had some really brilliant ones, he kind of zeroed in on something that made me be like, shit, I got to do a page one rewrite on this thing. And like, cause like, it's going to be, a, it's going to keep a lot of the, th the elements that made it special, but like enough is going to change tonally and just character wise that like, I got to kind of go through it the whole way. And like, that can happen. Um, so it is what it is. Um, how many hours a day do you guys spend reading and writing? That's a quick one. Um, I go through phases. I haven't written anything or read. Well, I've been reading. I'm, I'm back in my yeah, reading, reading phase. A hours a day. Yeah, if I'm not writing, uh, I don't try to keep a time limit. So I would say, I mean, I go, I can go anywhere. If I'm writing, I, I, it's usually five to ten hours. If I'm in the script writing it, it's straight up. I'm isolated, five to ten hours, whatever. However, I can make that work. Reading, same thing. I try to read, um, I knock out my friends' scripts that they've sent me. I'm, I'm catching up. I have a few left, uh, but you know, that's typically two, three hours per script, depending on the notes. Um, so that, again, could be five to seven hours. That's not every day. I go through phases. I'll take a week off and not do anything or think about writing. And then the following Monday, I'm geared up again, re-energized, and I want to read five that day and start writing on Tuesday. So it just kind of varies. What about you, Dave? Because you're still- uh, I'm very job, similar right? here. <laughs> yeah, very phasey. I would say, I mean, in, in, I, I'd say I, I, you know, I also have those phases. I would say that I'm also, frankly, I'm kind of lazy. So I'm not necessarily the most dependable reader. It takes me a long time to even get to scripts, much less, you know, read them in their entirety even. Um, I am A-OK -okay with being very honest with myself about that and trying to keep myself accountable. Um, when I, you know, it's it's easier to talk about when I am doing those things, you know, what kind of hours I put in. I, man, when I'm writing something and I'm very engrossed in it, there is no limit to how many hours in the day I'll be writing that script. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But it might vary day to day, you know, it might be like, it might be an hour one day and then literally be like 18 hours the next day and then be six hours the day after that and then be zero hours and then be another 20 or something. I remember, and also when I'm writing a script, I'm really in the zone. I do, I do tend to forget about everything else. Um, as someone who is a binge eater and loves food to a very unfortunate uh, degree. I There was a script I was writing a couple of years ago where I was just so, I, I was writing so much throughout the days that I forgot to eat. I just literally was like, what, what, I was like, what is food? Why, why should, why would I care? <laughs> why, why, why would I care about food? Uh, anyway, uh, so yes, it's super all over the place. There's no set amount of time. 
even if I was like on an assignment, I, I, it would still be just like whenever I felt like it. It's just whenever I feel like it, you know? Awesome. Um, how are you guys doing on time? I should ask. There's a handful more and I can kind of, we can get. Oh, I'm good. Think so. I'm, but, I'm good. Okay. Um, so let's see, Clint Williams, who I think you guys both know, um, cool. he, uh, Dave, I think this is a good question for you. Uh, cause you've done a lot of pitching this year. Um, what, do you, how do you answer the question? Why you, uh, if an exec wants to know why you should be the person to write something, uh, that feels like cause I thought of it. That feels like bait. Cause Dave loves that question. No, he does not. Do you really? <laughs> <laughs> Hell no! I hate, this is the dumbest question in the industry. Um, it makes no. It makes. It's like it's like in if it's like being on a job interview and the person interviewing you goes, "Why you?" And it's like, "Why do you think I'm here, dude? Like I'm here for a job. It doesn't make any sense. I should be asking you why you then in that kid. But anyway, um, luckily, it has happened, but it does not happen often that people ask that question because. If you are in a situation where, let's say, what typically happens, especially for assignments, which is where you're most most likely to come across this question, I feel like, in my in my opinion, and from my experience, um, the execs have kind of already answered that question for themselves. So, for instance, when they have something that they need to get written, they will think back on scripts that they read and the writers that they feel would be like a good fit for that for it. And they will reach out to those agents, most likely the agents, sometimes the managers, but most likely the agents. And then the agents will relay that information to the writer. And, you know, believe it or not, it, the ball's kind of in your court as to whether or not you want to engage with that project and develop a pitch for it. And I've said no sometimes. So I haven't even been in the situation, you know, in that particular situation. I didn't even need to answer why me. Um, and once you're doing the pitch, Ideally, your pitch would also kind of answer that question anyway. Um, there's, you know, it depends. It, it's so nuanced because some places don't care, and some places will be like, "Ooh, my favorite thing about the pitch is when you explain why you." Uh, that's the thing that we really loved. Um, so, I would say, no matter who you're pitching to, you you should kind of have that answer built in to your pitch. It's pretty rare. Like in order for that to happen, you would have to come across certain very particular execs who want that answer, and then not, and then you don't have an answer in your pitch. Only in that you know very certain, very specific cir circumstance where you, you might get that question um, at the end of after you pitch, and then it's very very hard to answer because a lot of the stuff that you are pitching on has nothing to do with you, um, and also. If you have, if you did already kind of explain it in your pitch, and they're still asking you that question, it's it's even harder. It's because now you have to kind of, you, you're gonna have to fabricate something, man. Like, let's just be honest. Um, I feel like so yeah, so whole, much of what we do is talking out of our ass. Like, you know, one hundred percent. That's what pitching is. So <laughs> yeah, please. Hey, let me add. I just wanted to add. Uh, for me, like everybody, kind of you know grunts when they hear why you, why this, why now. But I think it's it's almost it could be the way I look at it too is like it's the note behind the note in a way. So like someone could say in your script, this isn't working, your whole act two needs to be rewritten. That's not very helpful. At least you know they didn't like it. It gives you something to start with, but then it's up to you to if you want if you're game for it to figure out what made them feel that way, what made them say that. Go back and re-examine what you wrote. Are they is it valid or is it not? And so the, for me, the why you thing is a little bit I, I think it could also be described as What's your emotional attachment? What's your personal connection to whatever material you're pitching, especially for assignments? Um, so if you're an action writer and you're up for a romantic comedy, it, it, it's happened, I'm sure. What's your personal connection to that concept that studio is trying to get you right? So that's one way to look at it, um, especially if the question's asked, you know, because if you don't have a personal connection to what you're doing, it's going to read that way. Um, Jason, so I actually, I is, oh, real sorry, quickly, sorry. Yeah. I actually have an uh, an example of I think Jason Jason brought up a great point where a lot of the things that I pitched on had nothing to do with the style of Clementine or anything, you know, producers and stuff. Are they all they care about is great writing and great scripts. They don't really care the genre so much, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so 
for instance, I was pitching on this thing that was kind of like Jumanji, but for toys. Like it was like a almost borderline kids movie. Uh, and these toys came to life and all this stuff, all this jazz. Totally not my cup of tea. And it was for a rewrite, mind you. Um, and the script wasn't great, but I guess it sold, but whatever. Um, and so I, I took it upon myself to... I brought an element to what I would do in the rewrite, which was that, uh, hey, you know, I, as a kid, I used to use the, I used to play with the remote control of the TV and make movies and pretend it was an action figure and, and do like pseudo movies with the remote control. And also, you know, sometimes the toys that I had, I would literally sit there for two hours making, playing out a movie. So what if this main character did that with these toys? And then in, we set that up in the first act, and in the third act, they they play out the movie to you know to help that's save fun. the day and that kind of thing. So that that's an example of kind of baking the answer into the question so that it doesn't have to be asked really. I like it. Um, let's see, Jason, this is a good one for you because uh, you know you kind of made some changes this year. Um, how do you find a, 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 an honest manager or a good manager like? Um, and um, I know you could go on for a long time about that, but like maybe like just yeah, like short. So, um, what's the best way to answer it? And how do you find a manager? Just how do you find an honest manager? I guess the question you have to do your research. I mean, when people reach out and say they're reps or producers, they should, I mean, if they've done anything or if they have those connections, you know, get on a call, do your research, you know, uh, IMDB pro, um, if they've made movies, see what kind of movies they've made, um, things like that. And in terms of finding them, it can happen anywhere. It really can. Uh, you, you need to do the work first and be getting that constant feedback from your friends and get to a point where you, you are confident in the material. And if enough people are saying, you know, why don't you have a manager or you should be looking for one or representation or whatever it may be, there's a thousand different paths. The frustrating thing about what we do, all of us, is um, there's no path you can't go i mean you can go to school for you know get your mfa your master of fine arts and hope to get a job but at the end of the day it's it's very um challenging to find ways to get your script in the hands of people who can help and make a difference and move the needle a little bit and there's websites galore the blacklist roadmap writers there's a you know there's a there's a whole different my, my recent manager found me off twitter i had a friend read a script he gave it a shout out the manager dm me we connected we vibed right away and we're off to the races okay. so it can happen anywhere don't discount anyone or anything if you think someone's below you or above you don't think of it how can they help me think of it as a blanket of networking and then eventually when you're ready and your scripts are tight and you're confident in them People are going to share them around and slip it to different people. And you never know where they're going to land. Good writing is going to rise. Um, you just have to be out there actively. Dude, you know, that's so true. Like you smart. never know who's reading your stuff. Like once it's out yeah. there, like if people like it, they do share. Like I had this general this week and like in advance, like one of the producers was like, I'm so excited to meet you. Like, you know, I loved your script. And I'm like, I don't even know which script you read because I never even <laughs> yeah. like he knew about me before I knew about him. Um, and he's like a very notable producer. So I still don't actually know what script you read, <laughs> but because yeah. we ended up sending him a new one. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, it's true. You just don't know who's reading you, um, and uh, like if if your material is good and you're getting it out there, like it does get shared. Um, but and real know, quick, in terms of finding like an honest manager, if, if people know who they are or if they've done some things, you have to do your research. So you're gonna have your own vibe with these people. You're gonna have a gut instinct. Do they feel right? Do they not? Do they like the same things I do? And then there is a little bit of a risk involved. You know, if you want to form this relationship, see how it goes. If it's not going the way you want, you can reassess. You know, nothing is really final. Um, but yeah, it, it is important to figure out, ask your friends, people you've networked with. Have you heard of this person? Are they legit? Eventually, somebody is going to come on board that knows or heard of them and, you know, kind of steering in the right direction. Totally. Um, Tom Shrek saying, what's up? Neris Nasiri saying, what's up? Uh... What's up, guys? Uh, Tom and uh, So, so out of Dave, out of a hundred generals, or you had more than that. Like, they, only a few wanted to do it in person. That was true, correct? Like, it, it was pretty much all Zooms. It's yes, the way it is now. Because LA traffic. Well, sucks. I mean, who to be fair, to, like, <laughs> who well, to, to be fair, most of those people don't even know. They don't even know where you where you're based in yet. Right. You know, only like some. Most, a lot of times, I'll get in the meeting and they'll ask me where I'm based in. 
it, so who knows? It could have been more people Same. who would have been down to meet up in person. Also, I've had plenty of times where I had a follow up, like drinks or something, or lunch with something, or so, with someone after I had a general. Once they realized that I was in LA, uh, but yeah, only like n not even a handful were like, "Hey, let's meet up in person." But yeah, sorry, just to, that was just to answer your question. No, no, it's true though. Um, and uh, like uh, you know, the only thing is, you just if you don't live in LA or like West Coast, you just gotta get used to scheduling things in Pacific time, and otherwise, it's just pretty much yeah. all Zoom. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see. Rebecca wants to know, um, Dave, what's your process for like taking an idea to script? Do you outline? Do you do beat boards? Do you just write? Like um because we you know jason had mentioned how sometimes you'll knock out a script in two weeks oh man you know my i can talk about my process and how i would, it would work ideally but to be honest there's a way that my reps want things to to go these days and so i just kind of just to kind of please them sometimes we'll meet me halfway but just to kind of uh please them i'll i'll give them like if it were up to me it's like for instance i'm about i'm about to write another pilot and I am working on an overview because my reps want to see, like, how, what is the outlook for the entire show? What is the outlook for the season? And then the pilot, who are the main characters? They, everyone wants to be on the same page. Like, when you have a team of, like, five people as your reps, they all, ideally, they would all be on the same page. So they just want to kind of all have the same outlook that you have. Um, and they just want to get into your head, really. They're not necessarily trying to make you work um and do things that you're not comfortable with or things that you don't feel like doing they literally just want to get into your head and, and see what you see um if it were up to like in before i got repped i pretty rarely outlined um the more i outline a script the less interested i become in writing it i i prefer to be surprised uh in the process there are exceptions though like kind of small exceptions well actually let me talk about my process first of all so i have an idea come to me i love it to death I'm like, holy shit, this is a movie. I want to write it immediately. What happens most of the time is that I'll just like, I think I'll just like not forget about it, but I'll kind of like, I'll let it kind of just kind of ruminate like in the back of my head for a while and for more ideas to kind of come in. So that can take weeks. That can take like weeks or months. And once I feel like I have a movie in my head or most of a movie, I'll probably just start writing and then see where it goes. Some instances like Clementine that happens a lot sooner, like it could be the same day um, where I have an idea that I fall in love with and the whole story or it, like 90% of the story comes to me. And then like within a couple of days, I start writing. And and then there's a third thing that happens, which involves a little bit of outlining. So for me, I can't start a script if I don't know if, how the first 10 to 15 pages are, like very specifically. I have to know everything about those first 10 to 15 pages before I start writing it. And so whenever I do start writing and stuff is just in my head, it's because I know those first 10 to 15 pages in my head. There are instances, like for instance, I wrote a script called Bear Skull, which is like a contained horror where I, for the life of me, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out this very granular details of the first 10 to 15. I had a broad idea of what I wanted to do, but I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. But I, so I felt like I wasn't ready to write. So to help, I started an outline. I outlined those first like 15 to 20 pages of like, okay. And I had the opportunity to see what I liked and all that stuff before I actually started writing. And that helped me get started. Um, and then in the past, when I have outlined, I usually don't make it in the outline process. I usually don't get past right after the second act break. I feel like after that, I kind of wanted things to flow. And from, I'm very much about flow in a script. And if I'm outlined, if the beats are so chopped up and so beady and so compartmentalized, uh, it takes away from that flow. And there, there's even instances which are, they're not super common, but you can read a script and you can sense when the beats are happening. Um, you don't want that from people who have read thousands of scripts. You don't want them to see through your screenplay. <laughs> you, want them, you want them to be along for the ride. Anyway, um, that's just my personal preference. But for my reps, I will put together like a one pager um, or an overview if it's a TV series. And then I'll go into an outline usually and try to keep things brief. And then once everyone's happy and they're all on the same page about the outline, then I go into the script based. Sweet. Um, awesome. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, do you guys have any exercises, or I guess we'll switch to Jason. Do you have any exercises or methods for coming up with plot ideas or twists or characters when you're dry? Um, it's probably one of the oldest cliches, but I go for a drive or a walk. Dude, or... just like getting out of like the like changing. Getting out of the mud. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's it can be challenging and frustrating. All that stuff comes when you're at least expecting it. So if you're thinking of the general, at least for me, if you're thinking of the general idea of what you want to do. A lot of times, I'll find, well, as soon as now I'm aware of it, but like before I wouldn't be, I just get so frustrated. Like Dave mentioned earlier, stressing yourself out over trying to reach whatever. Like, you know, I have two days off. I want to write 20 pages like that. Maybe you may pull that off. But if you don't, you can get really hard on yourself. And I think to know when you've entered that, you can call it writer's block or just pure frustration or you can't get something moving forward in your head that you want to step away, like literally step away, walk about. You'll hear it a thousand times from a thousand people. Walk your dog, take a shower, go, you know, drive down the road. Um, used to when I, when I had my day job, my drive in the mornings to work was my most uh, ripe moment of like idea generation. The music would be on, listen to song after song. Music's a big thing of it too. Um, title, song, music, but it would just, it, things would pop in my head. As soon as I got to work, I got my legal pad out. I'm starting jotting them down or in a Word doc on your computer and do the day job, come home and noodle some more. And then just keep building on that. But I think stepping away, is like Dave said, part of his process, I can vouch for it. He'll tell me all the time, hey, man, I hit page 15, I hit 25, I hit 30. And then he's like taking four days, man. I don't know what I'm doing. Brainstorming. And then a week will go by and he comes back, dude, I'm on 72, you know. Uh, but yeah, step away, step away and let your brain kind of figure it all out. Sweet. Dave, this dude, a good one for real you. quick. I, oh. Real, real quick to add on to that. Sorry. Uh, I can't tell you how many times Jason will hit me up when he's like at the end of a drive. Like, oh, dude, this, I, this idea hit me while I was driving. Um, this idea hit me while I was coming back from work or he gets back from a so many times Jason will like go on like a vacation or used to go on like a vacation or something. And then I, there's like a 70 percent chance that his drive from the airport or something he got some idea and then he'll hit me up and be like, I got this idea so I can I can wholeheartedly vouch. For yeah, driving being the X factor for Jason. <laughs> That's awesome. Dave, this one's good for you because I know that you have them. Um, what's a screenwriting pet peeve that makes you roll your eyes when you read it? Oh boy. Oh, oh baby. Uh, where do I even begin? I would uh, just like. One. <laughs> yeah, one just, yeah, yeah, right. Just like, <laughs> I think. I think when someone is writing a lot of words and not accomplishing anything, like when the when the action of the story is not moving despite the amount of prose, and it's not necessarily that like there's big blocks of text, that you can write a script that has giant blocks of text and prose, but it still it still moves the story. It's still interesting. When someone is taking like a page to describe someone doing like a twirl on like a stripper pole. And it's like, dude, like you could have did that with three lines of description. Um, what are we doing here? So like, that is a huge. That is like the number one pet peeve for me. I think uh, it's like it's like by far number one to be honest with you. I'm trying to think. There's definitely there's like so many that they're like actually kind of cluttered and I can't even like pick one. That's, that's good. That's probably the biggest one. We'll take it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Jason, any do you use any like specific structure techniques for scripts um, or, or is like different depending on the story? So like for instance, like are you like a, a sequence method guy or like do you have specific plot points or do you save the cat it or anything like that or? Um. Yeah, it just it honestly the concept kind of dictates it. So I wrote this, yeah. um, for instance, a big heist movie that had a bunch of characters on both sides of the law. That wasn't a simple beginning, middle, and end. Cop Cam was a straightforward, all happens in one day, beginning, middle, end, and it's just a one day thing of you know you're following a guy in a car, bad stuff happens, and they all have to deal with it. And um, but yeah, I think um, yeah. So Save the Cat, I've read that book. It's it's good for what it is. I mean, it gets you thinking about structure. It gets you thinking about when things should kind of sort of happen. It gives great examples. But once you've consumed it, put it away and leave it alone, write your script, and then start figuring out how, ways to like circum like to uh, do things differently to make people go, whoa, I haven't seen something done like this before. Or, you know, you kill off your main character on page 25. Very risky. But hey, you know, if you've got stuff to back it up in the next two acts, go for it. But yeah, the structure for me personally, um, simple act one, act two, act three, or you know, the two part act two, I kind of have in my head. And then um, 
I just let the concept kind of take it from there, you know. Like I don't want to have my big midpoint twist happen on page eighty. So I know somewhere in the middle, it's got to kind of be there. But I, I wouldn't get too hung up on that, or even page count in your first earlier drafts. You can always go back and really get in there and figure out what needs to be there and what doesn't, and just you know, bounce the ideas off your friends and keep playing with the clay. This is a, this is actually a good follow up, and I'll pass it off to Dave. So. Um... This user says, uh, when I first began screenwriting, I was confused about structure. Now I feel like structure is based on the way your character's goals unfold. Do you agree or am I off? Uh, man, that's a super interesting perspective. Um, I mean, that is worded in such a way that, like, it might just be the most helpful for them, you know, personally. I don't know if that's, I, I, I don't think know if that works for every, every like, writer. Think, yeah. Like it, it actually, like if that makes sense to you, like that's probably pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love, I, like I love what I heard, but I don't know if that works for me. I think that's a great thing for that writer. Um, could you repeat the question though, just so I can answer correctly? So when I first started screenwriting, correctly? I was confused about structure. Now I feel like structure is more based on the way your character's goals unfold. Do you agree with So that? objectively speaking, objectively speaking, structure works in a way where it's like you have your ordinary world it, it has to do more so about what's happening to your character and then their response to that and then what their goals are and then what are the consequences of those goals and then you know how bad do things get and then can they get out of it and then and then yeah they found a way to get out of it but now there's a bigger threat the stakes have risen now we're going into the third act that kind of thing um so it's not solely i would personally say that it's not solely based on your character's goals and how they're trying to achieve them to be quite frank, I think, I think you could do that however you wish. Like you can have, like for instance, I, I'm so sorry to bring up like my own scripts as an example, no, but for instance, you know the, the way that Clementine works is like the inciting incident is like on page two. Um, it happens like immediately, and then you know by page eleven, Clementine's goals are pretty clear, <laughs> and and then we go from there. You know, but there's different scripts where uh, you know. I, I think it always comes down to like, does the character have a choice or do they not have a choice? And I think both can be compelling um, and that might dictate the structure in a way, you know? So, you know, for that person, I wish they, I, I do wish they kind of went into a little bit more detail about why structure confuse them, but, uh, but I'm glad that they kind of figure out their own answer yeah, to that. That's cool. um, Jason, if you were to base a character on Nate, me, um how should uh they introduce me in a script <laughs> Nate, have uh, at it man this this could be dangerous <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, gonna be a lot. it's just gonna be a compliment friendship is writing on this yeah exactly <laughs> uh, um i'm gonna pass it on to dave <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 tall and beautiful. Tall, beautiful, and handsome. glasses. Uh, one of the most <laughs> one, of the me. Articulate, one of the most articulate people that I've ever heard speak about things he's passionate about. Um, and extremely talented writer. I've read a bunch of Nate. I've that's a, not no. That's that's going back to what Dave's pet peeve is. Like you're talking using a bunch yeah, of time to trying to get Dave right broke in here. <laughs> See, I've done, I've irritated Dave, so now Dave wants to take over. <laughs> I'll give, I'll, give Jason, I'll give Jason a pass on this one. Yeah, you know, that's all right. um, I, I appreciate you stab, taking a stab at it. All right, final question. Um, what upcoming movies are you most looking forward to seeing? Oh, uh, I've seen most of this year. I guess it'll be next year. Beverly Hills Cop 4 trailer just dropped. I'm stoked about that. But that's next year. Um, Oh, uh, the Iron Claw. I cannot wait to see that. That's oh, man, the one. Me too. I, like, that's definitely on my list. I've got to get right now. Is the Iron Claw. I can't wait for it to drop. Uh, uh, I got to see Ferrari. I don't think it's out yet. Same. I have a screener. Um, but uh, yeah, Iron Claw for sure. I, I really want to see American fiction. Um, that looks super interesting. And I also mm -hmm. just found out one of the um, my friends who was an actor in Aftermath uh, is in that. So that's ex extra exciting for me. Civil War, I'm super excited about. Yep, uh, Alex Garland. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm a huge Alex Garland fan um i'm sure there's a ton more that i'm not thinking about there's right a bunch yeah that's um i, I need to see i have yet to see oh, yeah get on poor things i highly recommend poor things to everyone oh, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that. godzilla minus one yet i need to see godzilla minus one for sure Man, that's, that's uh, next, next priority for me 
I haven't. I have. I went to the theater six times in November. I haven't been yet in December, so I've got to change that. Yeah. Yep. Weird. Fix that, man. <laughs> cool. Um, anything else you guys want to say? Uh, that's it for the questions. No, man. Thanks for having me and and uh, great questions. Really great questions. Yeah, there's and some good ones in there. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that we had some of our friends in there, like Neris and Clint and other people I may have missed. I don't have the chat up with me, so I apologize if I miss anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and the yeah. questions have been great throughout. The, like this class has been awesome. Uh, participation has been really good. Like lots of really smart, really smart thinking. Um, so uh, again, thank you to all of you who have been participating and who followed along today and who asked great questions for Dave and Jason. Uh, please. Uh, if you're on Twitter, go follow them and thank them there. Their ads are right in front of you on the screen. Um, but uh, I thank you guys so much for uh, your time uh, and uh, devoting some time to this today. It's super cool to have you and uh, get some other insights. Because, uh, uh, you know, as I've been trying to stress this whole time, like everybody has a different take. Everybody has a different path. Um, that's part of that nobody knows anything quote. But there are a lot of best practices and you learn those by getting to know other people and listening to other writers talk. Um, and so these perspectives were awesome. So thanks so much, dudes. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. All right. I'll catch you uh, on the chat. <laughs> All, right. All right, everybody. I'm going to thank end you. For yeah, I'll day. see you. Thanks for being so thanks so much for being part of this class. Um, it was an absolute blast doing it. Uh, and, uh, you know, please keep me in the loop on your scripts. Uh, this has been great. All the best to you and happy holidays and congratulations on uh, finishing